And how and at what age did you get interested in photography? So I was I was interested in photography from the time I was a kid. Um, I'm dyslexic, so um, I'm not badly dyslexic, um, but I am dyslexic. And I think I said the other night there are um, there are quite a high number of um, people with dyslexia who work in visual media. So lots of photographers, cameramen, and women, graphic designers, people I know who are dyslexic. And it's very natural for us to to work in um, in in a visual you know because visual media is a visual language. Um, and, and I've always said, actually, it's a, it's a, you know, it transcends language because if I'm a writer, I write a story and then it has to be translated into Italian or Spanish or whatever else. Um, whereas with my photography and, and with my video and multimedia, um, people can watch it anywhere in the world and, you know, they should be able to understand what's going on. Or if they don't, I haven't done a very good job. Um, so, uh, yeah, as a kid, you know, reading history books, going through history books, I was fascinated with conflict, but it was the images that really always captured my attention and particularly the um the images of vietnam so larry burroughs was a british photographer um who who uh, worked in vietnam extensively now i'm a bit young i didn't i didn't you know I'm, I, I wasn't i'm not old enough i'm not actually a bit young at all i'm 40 but I, I i mean what i mean is i wasn't watching the vietnam stuff coming out in real time yeah and i grew up in rural ireland so we were fairly isolated and um, to be honest, it was probably the images of Northern Ireland that I saw first. But going through pictures, going through uh, history books and magazines, looking at sort of World War II um, and other conflicts, it was Vietnam that really jumped out at me. Um, and Larry Burroughs was a big influence on me. And so, you know, growing up, uh, you know, in, you know, down in rural Ireland, there's not really an understanding of foreign international journalism. There's certainly not a, an understanding, or there wasn't when I was a kid, of photojournalism. So it wasn't something that I could see quite clearly how to do. So it took me quite a while to get there, um, but I did in the end. Okay. okay. And how did you become a photojournalist? Very simple. I got a camera and I taught myself how to take pictures. I, I have no training. I, mean, I didn't, you know, as I said, I'm dyslexic. I barely finished school in Ireland. Um, the Christian brothers very kindly expelled me a few years before my leaving cert, but I managed to do it anyway. But I didn't go to university. Um, you know, that was never going to be a career path or, or a path for me. Um, so I got a camera and I taught myself photography. Um, and I spent quite a long time trying to get work. Uh, eventually I moved to the UK and um, I worked in publishing here for a few years uh, and gradually just fought my way into Fleet Street. Um, and, you know... Fleet Street in the UK, the photography in general is great because really you turn up and you show people your work and that's all they're interested in. They don't care, you know, whether you've got a degree or you've got, you know, five. Now I'm not saying it's not worth doing a degree. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that you can, you know, if your, if your pictures are good enough or if your video is good enough, if you, if the work that you create is strong enough, you can, you can get work. Um, and you know, I mean, I had some tough times. It was difficult getting into Fleet Street, and I work. I was very poor for a number of years, but I gradually got to where I wanted. Um, and then I got a staff job with Agence France Press, which is yeah. one of these yeah. agencies. Um, and you know, I got that off the back of being. I had been a freelancer for um, AP. I'd been a freelancer for the Guardian. And then, yes, yeah, so then um, AFP offered me a job. And once that happened, you know, like within a, a couple of months, I was in Iraq. And after that, then I went to Afghanistan. Um, and then eventually, I, you know, I didn't work, I worked for AFP, I think, for maybe two years. Um, but, you know, I, once I was in Afghanistan, that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to, I really did not want to work back here um, in the UK or in Ireland. I wanted to be in Afghanistan. I knew that. Um, so I resigned from my job and uh, just kept going. Um, and at that stage, I'd already started working with multimedia, so I was I was able to, you know, that that's back in 2004, 2005. So I was quite an early adopter of multimedia, and I was so I was able to sell different products to different people and generate, you know, sort of different revenue streams, which which made it viable. Yeah, and how did you get the permission as a freelancer to cover on a fighting season, for example? <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite difficult. Um, I, I think look, the truth is, being a journalist, uh, more than anything else, I believe, is about being able to make connections with people. Getting people to tell your story, to tell their story, um, you know, quite often we're, we're, we're covering stories that are not very nice. 
and to, you know, to go in and ask somebody to talk about you know the death of their child or you know maybe losing their home in Ireland in the, in, in the downturn. You know, these, these are not things that are easy for people to talk about. And our job as journalists is to go in and get them to talk to us. And, um, you know, I consider myself to be a, a reasonably nice person. And so I'm not, I never try to trick anyone. I never try to force anyone. Um, and I think that that's, people can tell that. I mean, I know journalists who are fucking bastards and who will go in and completely manipulate a situation because they want the story and they want the fucking front page. And I am not one of those people. But those people can only do that for so long because everybody else will see through them. And so particularly with doing embeds, the military, they're a pretty smart bunch of people. I know it's easy, people will disparage them and people say they're a bunch of meatheads, or whatever, but they're not. And they have a very tight-knit community. And if you go into the military and you try and trick them, you go in and you are basically an asshole who is looking for a story that screws them over. They will know that very quickly. Um, whereas if you go in and you're sincere and you say, look, guys, I just want to tell your story. And I don't know what that's going to be, but I'm going to be here. And I'm going to be here for a couple of months. I'm not coming in for a week or 10 days. I'm going to stay with you for two, three months. And every time you go on patrol, I'll go on patrol with you. Every time... You know, you're in a gunfight. I'll be there too because I'll be out with you. Um, and if one of you gets hurt, I'm going to photograph it. And if, you know, if one of you dies, I'm going to photograph it. But I'm here to cover everything. I'm here to cover everything. And I'll also sit with you when you're getting your haircuts or you're playing cards. And, you know, when you sleep on the ground, I'll sleep on the ground. When you eat shitty food, I'll eat shitty food. And that, that's the only way it works. I mean, this is not just an embedded the military. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is the only way, you know, real immersive journalism works. You have to go and live the same way. Yeah, but by doing that, but because I had done that um, as a staff photographer, I had a relationship already with the, with the military. And, and I was able to say, well, look, this is what I did before. This is the work that I did. But more than that, I met, you know, I met a U.S. colonel, um, and I, I made a good connection with him. And he found me you know, one day. I was hanging out with the guys, and he didn't know I was there. And he, he helped me organize the nine-month embed because he, when I asked for it, he said, nobody's ever asked for this before. And I said, well, that's because nobody's prepared to give up this amount of time. They just want to come in, come out, get a story. And I don't want to do that. I want to see what it's like, what a full fighting season is like. And because no one else had asked for it, um, and because he thought I was a bit insane, um, you know, he helped me to arrange it. But there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of paperwork. There's always a lot of bullshit with these things. But actually, you can get around it. If you, you know, if you can talk to people and say, look, I am trying to tell your story. I'm not trying to find a Mi Lai massacre. I'm not trying to, you know, get a story in Rolling Stone that will get General McChrystal fired. I'm genuinely trying to tell your story, the good and the bad. Um, that, that's really the way to, you know, that I, that I managed to do it. But it's different now. I mean, the whole situation in Afghanistan has changed. And, you know, it's, I would say, oh, here comes that feedback. I don't know why. Okay, now it's gone. <laughs> But it's, it's difficult. In Afghanistan now, trying to get an embed now is almost impossible because there's nobody, you know, the military are not doing very much. They're just getting ready to go home. Um, but for example, I tried to go into Syria. Uh, well, I've tried three times to go to Syria. Um, I'm unfortunate. Anyway, it's very difficult. I'm not going to go into all the details. But the last time I was going to go, I had spent a long time getting to know some doctors, some, some Syrian doctors who have uh, UK citizenship now. And I was hoping to go with them, but it took me a long, long time to convince them that I was sincere and that I genuinely wanted to cover their story and I wasn't going to do a tabloid sort of turnover that I really wanted to tell their story. Um, and in fact, in the end, they watched quite a lot of my stuff in Afghanistan and they decided themselves that I seemed to be somebody who was sincere. Um, but unfortunately, the story didn't happen in the end just because the area became so dangerous that uh, it just it was unviable. But... Um, but so it's about, you know, that reputation of a journalist, that follows you through your entire career. So if you're, the, I mean, and I've seen it in Afghanistan. I've seen journalists who turn up once or twice. I see somebody new, I'm like, oh, trouble. Because A, they probably don't know what they're doing, and they're more likely to get themselves or someone that's killed. But B, they're very unlikely to come back, which means that they say to people, hey, look, you know, tell me your deepest, darkest secrets. It's between us. It's off the record. And then they leave and they just tell the whole story. And they don't care. Because they're never going to go back to Afghanistan. They don't care how much trouble the guys that they're with get in. You know, but if you're going to work in, in an, any, any beat, any subject that you're working in for a long time, you know, your sincerity will... will it, it's, it's, it's the old, um, my word is my bond concept. You know, if, you, if you're a decent person and you give people 
you know, your time and you, if you give them your word, you stick to it. I mean, there are loads of things that I've seen in Afghanistan that I haven't reported because I had said to somebody, you know, what I won't, you know, like I, I got taken out with special forces a few times and I wasn't allowed to, to cover. But they said, for your own information, for your own background understanding, you should see this. And so I did. And, you know, there's stuff that I might put in a book in 20 years' time, but I certainly wouldn't release it now. Um, but again, because you do that, you get that trust. And without that trust, it's impossible to work. Yeah. And it's yeah. also impossible to look at yourself in the mirror because if you tell people lies, you're not a very nice person. Yeah, of course. Um, which between the Canadian, British and US Army you found easier to work with or more approachable? I... Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, just, I don't really know how to answer that um, because they're very different. So, you know, the British guys, I guess, I felt I had more in common with because our cultures are the closest. And because I, although I'm Irish, I've lived in the UK a long time. So I, I guess it was it was very easy to identify with them. Um, the Canadian guys are, were extraordinarily friendly and, and you know, I, I had a very good experience with them as well. Um, they... I think they were really glad to have a journalist because they were getting very little coverage. So I think in a way, they were really glad to have a journalist around, which made, which made it a lot easier. Um, plus, we got into some very difficult situations very quickly. And, and I know because I'm friends with these guys now, and they, and they said that you know they had respect for me because of the way I dealt with the situation. So, so it was easy to deal with them. And the Americans, I mean, the Americans are a very different... Uh, it's, it's a very different setup with the Americans because it's such a huge army. But I've, I've had really great... I mean, I would say the best embeds I've had are with the Americans because they have this absolute belief in the freedom of the press. And again, lots of people criticize the embedding process and say that actually it undermines journalists and stops you from doing your job. And I don't, I don't accept that at all. And usually the people who say that have never been embedded. It's a very easy thing for people to say, oh, well, I would never embed because I'm not prepared to be, you know, uh, led around what the fuck are you talking about? You've never been there. You've no idea what it's like. I mean, I have flown around on medevac helicopters. I've, I've literally stood in the, in, in, in the area at bases where people are getting ready to go on patrol. And I've stood there like a hitchhiker, gone down and said, hey guys, I need to fucking get to Jalalabad. Is anybody going out there today? And someone will say, actually, yeah, we've got five trucks going that way. We can take a little bit. I mean, you know, now, if you listen to lots of the critics of embedding, they'll say, you know, everything's controlled, everything you're tied down. It's, that's not true. That's not true. Once you get in the system, the, you know, the, if you know what you're doing and if you're a sensible person and if people trust you, then actually there's a huge amount of latitude. There's, there's, a, there's a, a great opportunity to be able to move around, and particularly if you commit a lot of time. If you say to the U.S. military, oh, I want 10 days in Kunar, right? Fuck you. Like, it takes longer than that just to get to Kunar because it's very remote. But if you say to them, I want three months, they'll go, roger that. We'll get you there, but it's going to take a while. You know, I remember back in 2006, sitting at Bagram Air Base for, I must have been there for 10 days, waiting to get to a, a particular outpost I wanted to go to. But the weather was bad, the helicopters couldn't fly, no one could move, and they kept just saying, look, you know, we'll try again tomorrow, we'll try again tomorrow. And after about 10 days, I said to them, look, I can get there on my own. I can, I can get a driver, I can get a taxi, and I can go to um, Gardez. And then she said, no, you can't, it's fucking suicide. And I was like, it's not actually, the roads are not that bad. I'm not going to be in a uniform, I'm not going to be carrying weapons, I'm a journalist. I'm not, you know, for you guys, it would be crazy, but for me, it's okay. And they and they were like, wow, well, okay, dude, if you can if you can get there, like you know, your embed is ready to go. So, but when I arrived, the guys at the other end all talked about that I was a complete lunatic. Um, but it, immediately, you know, they welcomed me in and and they gave me access. I mean, I actually spent some time with the U.S. Colonel, and you know, he was extraordinarily frank with me. You know, told me things literally on the record, and I was just sitting there going, oh my God, I can't believe he's admitting this. Uh, like not terrible stuff, but just problems they were having, challenges they were facing mistakes that they've made, which, you know, he was saying, we're trying to learn from this, but he was very open about, you know, problems they'd had. Um, so, I, you know, and the truth is, I've spent more time with the Americans than anyone else because they're just in more places in Afghanistan. I've been very lucky. I've been able to travel, you know, quite extensively and work quite extensively in Afghanistan, and that's because I, I spent a lot of time with, with the Americans. 
Yeah. And you often yeah, talk about your experience with the, the soldiers because, of course, you have been abandoned with them. But what if any was your scariest experience with the Taliban? Well, so I haven't, I haven't been in... I, I haven't spent time. I haven't spent time with the Taliban. So I have moved around the country on my own um, and encountered Taliban checkpoints, and I managed to sneak through situations that I really didn't want to be in <laughs> uh, quite recently. Um, I also sat down with an old Taliban commander, um, I guess two years ago. But you know, officially he's not Taliban anymore. Officially, he has reconciled with the government and he's not on a, a wanted list, and he lives quite openly in Kabul. Um, but the truth is, he, in his heart, he is still a Taliban, and he's actually one of the conduits. He's one of the, he's one of the people who's used in the attempts to have peace talks. Um, but he was a very intelligent man, um, very articulate, spoke quite good English. Um, but it was still quite scary because he had young guys around him. And I had a lot of assurances. You know, you, you don't go and meet these guys easily. Um, or, well, not if you have any brains. Um, you know, you need to have assurances. You need, to, you need them to give you a word that you'll be safe, that you're not going to be kidnapped over the road. So when I went to meet him, it was quite tense. And then we had an argument uh, because I thought that he was bullshitting me and I wasn't really prepared to, to accept that. So I didn't quite call him a liar, but I did ask him the same question five times because I got four bullshit answers in the fifth time. I like, I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to ask you anything else until you answer this. You know, he was saying, "Oh, you know, the armed." He wouldn't say the Taliban. He kept talking about the armed opposition. Oh, the armed opposition are approaching the peace talks. You know, with love in their heart, with a desire for peace. And I and I said to him, "Yes, but eight people just had their heads cut off in Helmand because they played some music in the house." Uh, so uh, that doesn't, and the people who did that, I don't believe have peace in their hearts. And um, how you know? And so I was asking, how much control do the leaders have over the guys in the in the field? And so he just he just bullshitted me, gave me silly answers. And I said, I said the fifth time, I just said, I'm not going to ask you anything else. If you answer this question properly. So he did, but obviously everything was very tense at that stage. And I wasn't particularly scared of him, but the other guys, like the young guys, his guards, his protectors. I was pretty, I was pretty scared of them, and I thought, you know, at the very least, I'm going to get beaten up. <laughs> I might get my camera smashed, and things might be worse. Well, actually, as it was, everything was fine. I was, I was let out. I mean, the interview ended at that point, um, but I was just let out of the place. And you know, the Taliban, well, the Afghans, not just the Taliban, but the Afghans in general, put a huge amount of importance in their word. So you know, when, and that's why it's so important to get this permission when you're going to meet someone. If someone says. You know, I give you my assurance that you will be safe when you're with us. Then I think that counts for quite a lot, and um, because they're men of, you know, the Afghans in general value their honour. And um, you know, it's something that in the West is not as important as it used to be. And um, I grew up in rural Ireland, and people then did keep their word, but now it seems to have, you know, it seems to have changed quite a lot. But in Afghanistan. I, I find generally in environments where people are very poor, where they don't have lots of money and they don't have big houses and they don't have fancy cars, what they do have is their honour and it's very important to them. And, and that's something that, you know, if you understand that and keep that in mind in Afghanistan, it can help. But by the same token, it's very important that you also keep your word. If you say to somebody, I'll send you a photograph or, um, you know, I'll mention you in this story because you've really helped me. You better do it because if not, they will not hold you in any respect in future. Yeah, yeah. And have you ever questioned yourself about whether take a picture or not based on an ethical matter? Based on a a ethical ethics, basically, if if it's a picture was ethical to take or not? In yeah. I. I don't think. I'm trying to say, I don't think I've ever not taken a picture. Um, I mean, uh, for me, it's pretty clear, you know, ethically, I'm there to report what's happening. So whether it's good stuff, bad stuff, I'll take a picture. Um, there are times when I haven't taken pictures because I don't want to take the picture. Um, so when people are, like, 
you know, when there are bodies, when there, when, when there are pictures that no one's going to publish anyway, and you just think, oh, really, I'm not going to photograph this because it's too gruesome, it's too horrific, and it's, you know, I don't want to actually remember this myself, but also, it's, no one will ever use this, so it's pointless. Um, there are times, what else have I not photographed? There's very little, actually. I mean, I will, I will photograph and... You know, I mean, there are times, like, for example, with the Canadians, when they captured those uh, those Taliban uh, guys, you know, I have to work very carefully because you're not allowed to photograph prisoners' faces, you're not allowed to photograph any identity tags. But, you know, you can just move around behind them, photograph them from behind, do close-ups of their hands when they're tied up. And, you know, there, are, there are ways to portray events without showing the whole scene. Um, and so I've, I've done that quite a lot, you know, and I've done that with people who are wounded as well, where you can show, like, you know, a face, a, a, a grimacing face. Oh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you. The, the thing that I didn't want to photograph, um, or one of the things I didn't want to photograph was I photographed, I think I showed you tonight, actually, yeah, the memorial service of the guys that, that died. Oh, no, I don't, actually, I didn't get a chance to show it. Um, so in 2007, I was in Tia in the east of the country, and uh, basically two, uh, an IED went off under a Humvee, and uh, two guys were killed. And what the Americans do um, in the field, they don't, you know, like obviously the bodies are flown home, the families and all the friends at home get together, and they have a big funeral, and the shots are fired in Arlington Cemetery, and they fold up the flag and they give it to the grieving family, and it's very. It's uh, it, it's very ceremonial. But the guys in Afghanistan don't get that. Like they see their friend one day, he's dead five minutes later, and then he's gone. And they don't get to go to the funeral. They don't get to have that experience. So what the military does, they have this memorial service where they get the rifles and they turn them upside down and they put the helmet on the top or the, or the hat. These are like vocabulary guys. So they put like, the steps on the top. They hang their dog tags off. Them. And they have a ceremony to say goodbye. And it's really emotional and it's really horrible. Um, and it's... In my opinion, I, no one's ever clarified this to me, but as far as I can see, it's actually designed to be massively emotional and to make you fucking cry because they want these guys to get the emotion out so they can then go out half an hour later and go back to the war. Um, but I've never seen, I mean, I've seen, them, I've seen photographs of them, and, and so, but I've never been at one myself before. But when I was there, so the guys were preparing the day before, and they were setting up the hall and, and making the stands for the rifles. And I said, I, a couple of people asked me if I was going to photograph it in film, and I said, no, I'm not. I don't, I don't think that it's the right place for me to be. And, um, you know, I, I want to let people grieve in peace. And then the captain, Captain McChrystal, and the first sergeant, the senior sergeant of the company, um, First Sergeant Collins, they came to me. And I, I had become quite friendly with these guys. I like these guys. And I'm still friends today. They came to me and they were like, Hey motherfucker, what's up? You're not gonna you're not gonna photograph this? You are not gonna film this? You're not gonna do your job? And I was like, Well, no, I don't think it's right. I you know, I think I should let people have their grief and peace and I think that um you know, I shouldn't be there. And they're like, Fuck you. It's fucking you know, it's a shitty thing. Yeah, we get it, and you don't wanna do it because it's gonna be painful for you. But you better fucking man up and do your job because you told us you wanted to fucking record everything that happens. Well, this is part of what happens. This is the shit that we do. It. So be a fucking man and go in there and photograph it and film it. And I was like, whoa. And actually, my neck has just gone up now. And I'm, uh, the hair of my neck has gone up again remembering it. But they were right. They were right. And the main reason I didn't want to do it was because I felt it would be wrong to be there. But I also felt I'm going to feel horrible. I'm going to feel like a fucking vulture in there. But I'm glad I did it. I'm really glad I did it. And actually, you know, the wives of both the, the men contacted me afterwards and thanked me, you know, because they got to see the photographs and the, and the service. Um, and I'm, I mean, I, I don't ever want to do one again. That's one of the hardest days work that I did. Um, and I, but I'm glad I did it. Uh, you know, but it's one of those things I nearly didn't do. Yeah, like, there's a couple of other things, like, you know, like, the, I think I talked about the, the situation in Sudan when I was in South Kordofan in the hospital and the little girl was dying. I didn't photograph that because I just couldn't. I just, you know, I was an emotional wreck at that stage. And, you know, I, I know there are times when you just have to say, I fucking can't deal with this. And the best thing I can do is go out because otherwise I'm going to be a wreck and then I'm not going to be able to do my job. Yeah. Yeah. And is there, per is there any particular scene or image of the Afghani war stuck in your mind? <laughs> 
Oh my yeah, God. I guess there are like billions that yeah. like I know, but if and there's can, something like that I, particularly, yeah, I can I can re I can repeat conversations from eight years ago yeah. almost word for word. I mean, the thing is, it's so intense out there that you remember it so clearly. I couldn't tell you what I had for lunch yesterday, yeah. but I I can I could tell you you know like literally moment by moment about. You know, and not just gunfights, but other difficult situations that I was in in Afghanistan. It's all, it's 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 very very clear, um, and it stays with me. And it's not all, it's not all the bad stuff. I mean, you know, I, the other night I was trying to talk, I was trying to make the point. You know, with the with the with the title, I went to war and it followed me home. I was trying to, and I don't know if I did it properly, but what I was trying to explain to people is, you know, I don't believe I've post traumatic stress, but I, but my but my life has been affected by by the time I spent in the war. Um, and anybody's well, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, I'm screwed up or whatever else. Anybody who goes to a situation will be affected, you know, and so I have, I have, you know, hundreds, hundreds of images in my head and I think about it every day. I mean, I think about people that died, but I also think about, you know, the villages that I've been in, you know, and, and I'm in contact with a lot of people. So I talk, I talk to you know, I talk, I, I email and, and message and talk to lots of people, you know, Americans and Afghans that I've met over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And when you went, like, to Afghanistan to the war the first time, was it everything as you expected to be or it was completely different when you actually faced the war? Um, yeah, what's it like? I think, well, the... I don't think no. I don't. I don't think it was what I expected. I don't think it's possible to go and have an idea of what you're going to face. I mean, the you know, I'd read a huge amount of history on Afghanistan, so I didn't go unprepared. Um, and in fact, I remember talking to a Canadian guy, an officer, and talking about an area that we were in, and saying, "Well, you know, during the during the fight against the the Soviets, you know, the Mujahideen used to use this area to transport stuff, and this one of the you know, and um, this is one of their logistics hubs." And, and he was saying, how the fuck do you journalists find this stuff out? How do you know this stuff? I was like, it's called Amazon.com. You should check it out. You know? Because all I had done was read history books. Uh, but I had read a lot before I went to Afghanistan. So in some ways, you know, I, I had a good idea of, or I thought I had a good idea of, of what the place was like. Um, but the fight itself, I mean, you know, particularly with the British, when I went to, well, with the Canadians, when I went to Kandahar, like, they were just figuring out that they were just on the ground. They were figuring it out themselves, and they were getting hit, you know, by IEDs, which their vehicles weren't set up, you know, they were not protected against, and they were getting, you know, they were they were having, they were learning on the job, and so when I, I arrived, it was very, very clear people are just figuring this stuff out online, so I was start figuring it out with them, and you know, the British the same. I mean, when I arrived in Helmand, like I was there before any British soldiers were killed, you know, I remember the day that they went out to. Um, um, well, sorry, they were in Lashkar and they went out to Sangin and Musakala and Kajaki. I, mean, I remember the day those helicopters, like they went out to those places, and I was trying to go with them. And they were just figuring out. And I came home, and actually, I, I, I spoke to the reporters at AFP, and I said that the biggest single story I saw with the British is they don't have enough helicopters. In fact, they don't have enough anything. They're riding around in snatch vehicles that they had in Northern Ireland. You know, they're they're a disaster. And so gradually the British figured out and they bought more helicopters and they bought better vehicles. Um, but so it, I don't think it was what anyone expected because you, you just don't know until you get there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how did your photographic approach um, change from the first time you went to Afghanistan to the second time, if it changed or if you learned something from the first experience and then you, you went there back and you wanted to do it different? I don't know why photography changed at all. I mean, I just went through some stuff, you know, for that presentation. I was going back through stuff from the like the first and second year that I was there, and I don't think my photography really changed. I mean, I've always been somebody who photographs people. You know, I I'm interested in the in the people's experience. Um, now, somebody interviewed me a couple of years ago and said, "Why do you photograph so many guns? You know, there are loads of pictures of guns on your website." I was like. Oh, there's loads of fucking guns in the war. I mean, it's you know, <laughs> like they're everywhere. I, I don't go around and photograph. I'm not. I'm not some gun nut, some crazy guy. To, but they're everywhere. So if you try and photograph a wall, there's usually a gun leaning against it. Or if there's somebody lying sleeping, there's going to be a gun beside him. So there are a lot of guns in my pictures, but that's because there's a lot of guns in Afghanistan. 
but I see myself as a as a as a person. And if you look if you look through my photography, it it is almost entirely people. There's no there's there's very few landscapes, um, very few detailed shots or you know ge- general views or shots of vehicles or still lives or anything. It's it's people. And so from the, from the very start, I think it was like that. I am um, you know I've really it has been hard to photograph the Afghans because when you're embedded, you don't get access to them a lot. But also because they, they the way they engage with photography, you try to take a picture, they just do this. And it's very unnatural. And so you can get some portraits, but trying to photograph, you know, them, in, in, you know, sort of looking more natural is very difficult. And I've really, and I, you know, I've, I've worked hard at that. And that's why I started using the iPhone back in, I guess, 2011. Um, because it, you know, drew less attention. Um, you know, I also started, you know, a few years, a couple of years ago, I started bringing a large format film camera with me and, and, you know, developing five by four sheet film in tents and bathrooms and stuff. Um, so I've tried lots of different ways to, to, to make the, the, the photography, um, work in, in the conditions. But, you know, I don't, but I, but I don't think that it's, I, I don't think, I don't think the war affected my photography. It affected lots of other things, but I don't think it affected my photography. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I'm from a safe job position in London, uh, and you also got shot, but then as soon as you rehabilitated yourself, you wanted to go back to Afghanistan, and yeah, you went back there. So do you think that um, photojournalism is more a calling for you than a job? Yes, mm-hmm. I do. Okay. And, I think, and I know lots of other friends who would say the same thing. You know, I could make more money if I, I mean, I could make more money in London. If I just if I just concentrated on my photography or, or my multimedia here, I can make more money. So I it, I'm not I'm not you know I'm not going to Afghanistan. Like some people think, oh, you must get paid a whole lot of money to go to dangerous places. Nope, no, I don't get any extra money for it, and there are lots of extra costs. So I could make more money here. Um, I, I go to Afghanistan because I believe it's really. I don't want to sound like a sanctimonious idiot here, but I do. I genuinely believe it's important. I genuinely believe that someone has to go out and tell the story and. However bad things are out there, it would be worse if no one was was telling the story. Um, and so I said the other night, like, you know, someone asked me, why do I do it? Said, because I think I'm reasonably good at it. And I don't mean like I'm a good photographer. I'm an okay photographer. I'm an okay filmmaker. I'm not great. I'm okay. But mentally, I have, I, I seem to have that balance. I seem to be able to deal with situations, however stressful, however unpleasant, and you just get through, you know, you go, Oh, this is fucking awful, and you get through, and then when you go out the other side, you have a think about it, try and process it, and then you put it to one side, and you think, okay, that was horrible, I'm done with that, and then you go to the next one. You know, one of the, and it's not, it's not always like that either, I mean, a lot of the, the biggest challenge in Afghanistan, and, and you know, Iraq, uh, Af- you know, Sudan particularly, the biggest challenge is fucking loneliness and boredom, because it's not all action. A lot of it is sitting around waiting for things. And as a journalist, you're always the outsider. I don't care how embedded you are, but you are the outsider. So you're on your own a lot. You know, you, 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 these people are not your friends. However friendly they are, they're not your friends. Um, so you spend a lot of time on your own. Um, and you, because you're moving between different places, you turn up, people don't know you, you're on your own again. So, and I, I'm, again, I don't sound like a little crybaby or anything, but there, it is, there is a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of boredom. Like someone said to me years ago, war is 95% boredom wishing something would happen and 5% sheer terror wishing you were still bored. And, and that's, that's a, a good assessment of it. Um, but I seem to be able to deal with all that. And there's also the deprivation, you know, sleeping on the ground, you know, with spiders and snakes and stuff around. I hate spiders, man. You know, I, I don't like that, but you just adapt to it. You know, I remember being up in Tora Bora um, in 2006, like late in the winter, and we got trapped in the mountain. It snowed, and we got stuck there for about a week. And we were sleeping in the sun. Nobody had any tents or anything. It's just some Humvees, and, and basically, like sleeping bag at night on the ground, like it basically looked like a grave because you stomped down the snow and made like a little tunnel, and then put your sleeping mat down, and then put your sleeping bag down, and you know, to hide your feet towards the the fire. And obviously, it's freezing cold, and so you just fucking chippered your way through the night and didn't sleep that well and got up in the morning and ate whatever shitty food you could get. And those, like, there are lots of people who would say, there's no way I'm doing that. And I'm not saying I enjoy it. I mean, it can be really harsh. Uh, but, you know, mentally, I, I'm able to deal with it. Um, and I think the biggest problem for me going forward 
is that the, the reason that I will eventually stop doing this is not because of any of that, but mentally, my problem now is I feel very guilty about being away from my kids. And that, it's not there yet, but I know that that will eventually overcome. the other. So all the other stuff that I can deal with is fine, but I can't deal with being away. You know, my three-and-a-half-year-old said to me the other day, Daddy, I don't want you to go to Afghanistan again. And I thought, you're three-and-a-half. You shouldn't even know Afghanistan exists. You shouldn't be able to say that word. Um, you know, the last time I went away, she came downstairs early. I was supposed to be gone. She saw my bags. She's like, oh, you go to Afghanistan again? And, and so that, however mentally tough I think I am, that, I think, is what's going to wear me down. So, you know, the, the, the other things I can deal with, um, and, and while I can, I should, but I think that's what will yeah. yeah. end it. <laughs> and what was your toughest moment and the most rewarding one in your career so far? The toughest moment, well, there's a few. Getting shot was pretty tough. Um, you know, I, like mentally, you know, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I, you know, I, like I got shot in the chest went through my intestines out my lower back it was extraordinarily painful and I had just seen quite a lot of other people die around me so I really didn't think there was much chance of getting out of there alive um, and I remember thinking fuck I'm you know, really screwed up you know, I, I, you know, I wasn't married but my, my girlfriend at the time you know, who I loved to bits who I'm now married to um, I thought I thought I've really screwed up and if I die here I've really fucked up her life and you know I, I really, you know, and I'm very angry at myself. And then I thought, maybe I won't die. Maybe I'll just be paralyzed or something. Fuck. And then I remember thinking, oh, maybe it'd be better if I just died. And at that moment, it was like a conversation because another part of my brain was just like, fuck you. I will not die. And once that took over, you know, that's, I, I believe that that's what got me through. I just was too stubborn to die because the doctor said I should have died. They said there's actually several things that should have killed me. Um, and I believe that I just was fucking too stubborn to die. Um, but that was tough. That was really tough, you know, and, and I've gone over that many times in my head, and, and that was tough. Um, the situation in Sudan, in the hospital in Sudan, in South Kordofan, that was very tough. That was very tough. There was a doctor there, an American doctor, who had refused to leave. All the NGOs had been pulled out once the bombing, the area of bombing started, because Khartoum were basically sending bombers overhead and bombing the civilians, bombing villages, indiscriminate, you know, straight up war crime and um, and this one American doctor had refused to leave and, he's, and, they, and his agency had said well if you don't leave you know your insurance we won't be able to cover you we won't be able to protect you and he said well if I leave here I'll never be able to look at myself in the mirror again you know I'll never, I'll never forgive myself and I admired that guy a lot um, but watching him in the hospital like he was you know I mean he, there's no doubt he saved many many lives but he can't he couldn't save everyone and when that little girl was dying, the screaming of it, that was just really tough. And that was one of the days when I thought, I'm going to fucking lose it here. I'm actually, I, 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 am, I am absolutely at my break. I'm full. You know, I'm at that point. Um, and so, you know, and, so, and, and, and I went outside and I, you know, was angry at myself because I thought, you know, you should be filming more, you should photograph more. But I also was going, there's a limit. There's a limit. And if you don't recognize your limit, that's how you end up with post-traumatic stress. If you're not able to, if you're not able to, you know, it's like running. You know, I'll go out and I'll run. And at a certain point, I say, you know, I need to stop now. I'm going to get an injury. And people who don't stop, who keep going, who say, oh, I'm going to push it further. Yeah, well, good for you. But now you've got an injury. Now you can't run for four weeks. So, you know, having that, and, I, and it's something I've learned, I think, with the military as well. Having, you, know, you have to push yourself hard, but you also have to know when you're at your limit because there's no point in being injured mentally or physically and not being able to go on. So that was very tough. Um, yeah, there, there's, been other, there's been other situations. I remember, again, in, in an operating room in Afghanistan where some people came in, they'd been blown up by an IED, which was meant for the military, but of course far more civilians get hurt and killed by these improvised explosive devices. And it was, I remember one night particularly, there was two people, a husband and wife, a man and a woman in, and they just were shredded. And it was very tough to keep photographing, keep filming, because you just wanted to go outside and cry. I wanted to go out and fucking kill somebody. Um, yeah, I don't mean literally, but I mean, you know, the anger that comes up in you. So, yeah, there's been some tough times. Yeah, but there must be also, like, some kind of satisfaction sometimes, some rewarding moments 
or moments where you felt like you you were doing like the right job you were doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the um, I, I think like the the high point of my career has been the photograph. So after the Sudan, after the South Kordofan thing in two thousand and eleven, the um, the a, a U.S. congressman after the film broadcast in Al Jazeera, a U.S. congressman got in touch and said that he wanted to raise this issue in Congress in the United States, and he wanted some screen grabs. He wanted some images that he could use. And I said, well, actually, I, I can do better than that because I'm a photographer as well. So I've got a whole lot of, you know, high quality photographs that, and you can have them, you know. And so the next day he stood up in Congress and I watched it on C-SPAN, the American um, broadcaster. And I watched as this conference stood up and talked about South Kordofan and it was, you know, basically entirely down to, to this film. Um, and then he showed my photographs and, and then they were, you know, they were, they were entered into um, the Library of Congress afterwards, you know, as, as evidence of war crimes. And, and that is, you know, that I felt that that was a real achievement. However tough it was in there, um, and how fucking scary it was, um, I felt that that was a real achievement. Um, but there were also, there, there were easier moments. I mean, you know, I remember, like, I went into Bahrain at the start of the Arab Spring, and I made a film... I made a film that went out when I was zero, and subsequently, almost everybody who was appeared in the film was arrested, went to prison. Lots of them were tortured, and so that was one of those tough times. But I met one of the guys afterwards. He got out, and he's living in the UK now. He, he, he got managed to get in, and he, he he claimed asylum. And I met him, and he said he's still really glad that that film was made because it told their story, and he's really, despite everything, and this guy was tortured horrifically. And he said, despite it all, it still showed the world what was happening. And so from that, because I had been so upset about what I knew was happening to people, to have him say afterwards, I would do it again tomorrow, I'm really glad you made that film. That's one of those moments where you think, actually, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Um, and then there's just the, there's the professional satisfaction. I mean, particularly in gunfights, like being able to work in a situation that is so intense, you know, that obviously, you know, you're trying to not die and you're trying to watch everybody and see are they going to move, are they going to pop smoke, you know, what's, the, you know, trying to understand that. And they photograph everything in the subconscious. You don't really remember taking pictures or video. But afterwards, there's that feeling afterwards when a shooting stops and you just think, when you sort of look at yourself and you think, you know, I'm still alive. But also you think, I did it, I did it. I like, you know, to be able to work in that extreme circumstance. And that was why I showed that video at the, at the end the other night. Um, you know, it's uh, just it's just, uh, you know I just cut it out of the of the film Drawdown, which I made earlier last year. Um, but to be able to work in that situation is extraordinarily difficult, and there's not very many people who can do it. And there is a sense of achievement afterwards, and you think, you know, this is why I keep doing it because I can. And the first day that I just go, oh fuck, 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 and put my camera down and, and take just see cover, well then that's the last day I'll go out because I will know, and, and I don't feel bad about it. Like, that will happen at some stage. And, I, you know, I won't consider myself a coward. I'll just think, again, I've hit my limit. And we all have limits. And, yeah, I think that's, the, that's really important to recognize them. Of course. Of course. And in the past development of the internet and its easy accessibility, what do you think that freelancer photojournalists should do to be competitive in the job market? Um, I think that we all have to be able to multitask. We have to be multimedia journalists. We have to be able to shoot good photographs. We have to be able to shoot good video. We have to be able to record audio. We have to be able to edit all of that together into different types of stories. We have to be able to write to a certain extent. I'm dyslexic. I find it difficult. But word and spell check and everything can actually, you know, help a lot. Um, but we're journalists. We're not photojournalists anymore. Or we're not writers. Or we are journalists. And we are visual journalists, I guess. Some people talk about visual journalism. Um, but I think the truth is we're journalists. We're storytellers. Our job is to tell stories. And sometimes the best way to do it is with stills. Sometimes the best way is with video. Sometimes the best way is with some audio. And you say, oh, and I'll use some stills as well. Um, but we have to be able to do all of those things. And we have to be able to do them properly. Not, you know, not shoot 20 seconds of video on a 5D. You have to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to say, right, how do I build, how do I build a sequence for TV? Or, no, or how do I build it for online? You know, one, of the, one of the things that frustrates me is you, an awful lot of TV are just trying to transpose their stuff directly onto the internet. Well, it doesn't work. If I watch something on my iPhone, 
it's not the same as watching it on my 27 inch Mac or my 40 inch TV downstairs. And so people who are shooting for that have to be able to shoot in different ways. Um, so we have to know all of these skills and we have to continue to educate ourselves because the industry and the technology is changing every day. It's not enough to learn, you know, do your degree, come out of college and say, right now I know what I'm doing. Bullshit. We will be learning until the day we die. But that's, that's how it should be. Yeah. yeah. And can you tell us about your iPhone application called Markstar? Markstar, yeah. Markstar, very simple. It's a watermarking app. The idea is taking pictures and putting them on social media. I mean, you know, pictures on my website can be copied and, and stolen. Pictures I put anywhere online can be stolen. But most stuff is copied on social media. And lots of, pe lots of people are taking pictures on their phones, uploading them straight to social media, and there was no facility to watermark it. If I shoot something on my 5D and then I bring it into Photoshop or, or to Aperture, I can add a watermark before I put it up. Fine, that's easy. But most people can't do that. Most people don't have Photoshop. Most people don't, wouldn't know how to use it. And more and more people, it's like 1.4 billion smartphones in the world now. People are shooting a lot of pictures on their phones and they just put them straight up to Flickr or Instagram or whatever else. Um, and I just wanted to be able to protect my copyright. I wanted other people to be able to protect their copyright. Um, and yeah, Mark's, I'm like, you know, I did it with a partner. I didn't do the coding. Somebody else did the coding. I just, you know, sat down with somebody and said, this, I believe there's a real need for this. I believe that lots and lots of other photographers are very frustrated, just like I am, um, with their pictures being copied and infringed. But I want to make it really simple. And of course, it's a classic situation where actually it takes quite a lot of hard work to make something look simple. Um, but Marx is very popular. Um, it has been very popular. Uh, um, and I believe that that's because, A, it's simple to use, but B, there are lots of people out there who are concerned with copyright and intellectual property, and and and, and Marx gives them a way to protect that. Yeah. Uh, last question. So, uh, what will be your advice to someone who wants to pursue your same career? <laughs> I would say think carefully about it, because, like I said the other night, I, there, is, there, I, there is an impression I think with lots of people that you know working in conflict zones, whatever, is a very exciting job. And there are moments when it's very exciting, but there's a lot of boredom, a lot of loneliness, a lot of time away from your family, um, and a lot of mental baggage that you will pick up, regardless of how balanced you are. Um, but still a great job. I mean, I love what I do. I, I absolutely love what I do, and I feel incredibly lucky to be able to do it, despite all of the, 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 all the um, other considerations. Um, but... The work that I do is changing. So I would say, you know, it, it's it's foolish to try and emulate somebody else's career. Like, say, Larry Burris, the photographer in Vietnam, you know, the way he worked, the, the way he operated, you know, having two or three months to shoot one story and then getting, you know, you know 15 or 20 pages in Life magazine. It was amazing. And, and I wish I lived, I, you know, not I wish, but when I was younger, I wished that I'd lived in those times because I thought that was a great way to work. But I don't. That's the reality. So... I live it today, um, but the work that I do, I can publish more stuff online than Larry Burr has ever published in his life, and I know that, and I take full advantage of that. I mean, I, I publish stuff, you know, I'll come back from Afghanistan, I'll just able to use some stuff on the website, I'll sell some stuff, you know, to maybe Newsweek or somewhere, and the Irish Times use a lot of stuff recently, but there's other stuff that nobody takes, and so now I just publish it online myself. I put it in multimedia pieces, I put it in photo galleries, so I'm able to get these stories out, whether or not I'm getting paid for all of them. You know, if I get paid enough for some, then I can I can put the others out without getting paid. Um, but trying to emulate what I've done, I would say to people, don't try and do that because the world is already different to the to the place that I started working in. Um, so try and find your own voice. You know, figure out what you care about. Don't worry about the money so much. You know, just do what the money will come. If you're good at what you do, the money will come. Just commit to what you want to do, and then don't let anyone fucking tell you about anything else. Just do it your way. You know, tell good stories. It's all about telling stories. That's what we do. We tell stories. Be honest, you know, with the people that you're covering and with your audience. You know, and I, I you know, I, I, I've never tried to seek fame. I don't want to be a famous journalist. I don't want to be one of the big names or whatever. I can give a shit about that. And I know other journalists who really do want to be a big name and they want to, you know, win awards. Um, and I think that 
you know, that's the wrong way to go about it. I believe that's entirely that's the wrong way to go about it. You know, we're not supposed to be the story. The people who are recovering, they're the story. We're just the conduit. We're just we're just a way of getting that out. And I think if you focus on that, the technology is changing. We have to keep up with it. But don't get too caught up. The te- you know, the, the technology tail should not wag the dog. We should use the tools that are available to tell stories, but we should not allow the tools to change the importance. The importance is, you know, a person, you know, the, the pain they're feeling or the joy they're feeling, why they're in a particular situation, you know, why the world should care and what can be done to, to improve. That, that's, that's essentially what we're, we're trying to do. And technology is changing. There are lots of great opportunities for us, but, you know, we, should, we have to be careful and remember that we're telling stories about humans to other humans.